Okay, hey, thank you very much for coming back. There's so many of you here. I thought that we might have a bit of attrition, but this is the most exciting part of the whole discussion because this is where we get to hear uh, your voice as part of it as well. And I'm sorry we didn't have questions before, but any that you've got, hopefully they can um, come through now. I'm going to hand over from a, a lovely man uh, who I share an office with at Beacon up in Ponsonby. And there is a space in that office. If any of you here would at all be interested in working with lovely people like us, not an employment opportunity, actually, if you want to locate your business there with us. Um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so I've had the pleasure of working with David and trying to hatch today's uh, performance. Uh, so uh, I will hand over to you, David. Kia ora koutou. Um, look, thanks, Verney. Uh, just want to acknowledge Verney and, and Beacon. Uh, you know, it's great to be in partnership and delivering today. And, look, great to see so many people here today. So thank you for coming and staying. So I'm Dave Zussman. I'm one of the senior program managers uh, for Community Housing Aotearoa based in Auckland. Um, there's myself, I've got my colleague Mark, uh, who's here from Wellington for a couple of days, so um, you know, come and catch us afterwards if you want to talk to us. Um, look, Char has over 100 members nationally. We represent and support um, community housing providers throughout the country, um, big and small, doing a whole range of um, housing from, and you know, we've already heard that the full range, from uh, addressing homelessness all the way through to kind of affordable rentals um, uh, private rentals is a space we want to get into, but also affordable home ownership. Um, and I mean, when we split it up, it could, doesn't do justice because I think we're all about housing is what we want to talk about. Um, one of the things, the reflections uh, with the speakers and um, presentations I've had so far is the, the community housing sector. They do all, all the things we've heard about. Um, they're doing the planning applications, they're getting their land, they're doing the developing. But one of the things that distinguishes them is they're in it for the long haul. They stay around. So um, with those developments, with those people that are in the developments, whoever they are, wherever they're from, whatever their circumstances, you know, community housing providers are here for the long term. So what that means is two things. Anything that goes wrong, they're accountable, they address it. But it also makes us pay much more attention to, to those the things that are important to making you know, really long-term, enduring communities. And one of my reflections just is that it's great that these, a lot of these, these um, you know, uh, developments get awards, but they get the awards in the first two years. I'd be interested to see what awards we get after 10, 15, 20, 25 years, because um, that's what really counts. And the last thing I want to say before we get the panel going is that, you know, there's a housing crisis, apparently. We're under the cosh. Um, we want to develop at scale, we want to deliver at scale, and the problem with that is, you know, it compromises a lot of our choices, and that's one of the things I think we're here to debate, is how do we stay focused on the things that are important? Um, so, um, what we're going to invite you to do today is, is we've, we've got a great panel here, and I want to introduce Hope Simonson, who's the National Housing Manager for Emerge Aotearoa, and going to help facilitate the panel. But it's great having the panellists, thank you for doing it, but in fact, you're all the panellists today, so there's some, you know, all of you have had conversations about this, so don't be shy and please participate. So I'm going to hand over to Hope. Kia ora tato. It's really great to be here today. This is a really big issue for us, particularly in the community housing sector, and it's so good to have the diversity in the room. I think that's really important. This is the interactive session. This is the bit where you get to jump up and have your say and talk to us about what's concerning you, the issues, the challenges, um, the innovation that you might be coming up with. This is your time, um, but we're going to be led by um, some awesome panellists here. We're going to start with Anahira from um, Ngāti Whātua Wāraki, um, who's going to talk, give, give us a little bit of a presentation. So each of the panellists is going to talk a little bit from their perspective, um, and then we're going to open the floor up for questions um, after the panellists. Now, I've got a couple of rules around the questions. Really keen for you to stand up, say who you are and the organisation that you come from. That's going to be really important. Um, keep your questions brief, to the point, succinct, um, keep your issues and topics um, to the point as well so that we can kind of keep things moving quite quickly. All right, great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Tina tata i katoanga me hiki a koutou ko huhui mai nei i tēnei rā. Uh, ko ane hira tōku ingoa. Uh, he uri tēnei no tupiriri, ko Ngāti Whātua te iwi, tēnā koutou. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Ane Hira Rāuri and I'm from Ngāti Whātua Rākei and I also work for the commercial development arm of Ngāti Whātua Rākei as well. So really privileged to be here and share um, a few things about our housing development that we've done up in Ōrākei. Um, Kainga Tuatahi, we went on this journey of um, turning uh, a piece of land that had four state houses on it, uh, one standalone and uh, four blocks of three, on four hectares of land. So we turned that, um, we decided actually this is not what we want our people to be living in, and we decided to make a direct investment into housing by turning that piece of land into uh, a wahi or an area that now um, holds 30 homes and gone from maybe 20 people to 120 people living on that uh, piece of land. So for us, uh, util the utilisation of land is really important and if we're wanting to house 5,000 of our tribal members back on our papakainga, uh, the way that we utilise our land is, is key for us. So I'll just go through a few of our... So this is just a bit about who we are. That's, um, that's a really significant moment for us, standing on the steps of Parliament when we signed our se treaty settlement in 2012. From that point moving forward, that puts us in complete control on over our commercial assets and what we're about. So in terms of trying to reach, allow our whānau to reach the highest heights, you know, this is, this is a really good picture of who we are. So... That's us in 2012. This is our marae. We call it the hub of our world. <laughs> and this is uh, a, a shot of our papakainga. Uh, that's Takaparafau or Bastion Point. So if you look at this picture down here, you'll see that there's some cluster of houses there, which is Kiti Moana Street. Our housing development is a bit down the road here, and it's on Cooper Street Ridge. So that's just a bit of a snapshot of that. Um, if we want to be able to, lots of that land there is inalienable, which means we can never sell that. Um, in terms of Bastion Point, we co-manage that with the Auckland Council. So we basically gifted that back to Auckland City, and it's now a reserve under the Reserves Management Act. Um, this is a picture directly about our, of our housing development. So if you see there in the top corner, sorry. That's, um, that's an indication of what we were dealing with in terms of old state housing in Orake. So we own uh, almost, well not almost, we own 68 ex-state homes on Cooper Street. Um, what we've done in terms of our housing responsibilities to our whānau is that, one, we built 30 brand new homes for families um, to move back to the, to the papakainga. In terms of our state housing uh, that we've... Originally, we had them leased back to Housing New Zealand on a long-term lease. Once we got to 2013, shortly after we settled, we decided that we didn't, we didn't quite like Housing New Zealand as a landlord for our whānau. So what we did is we invested, directly invested about four to five million dollars in upgrading 68 of the state homes. So that saw us go in. Uh, we made them fully compliant. We put in carpet heat pumps, thermal curtains, repainted everything because we believe that investment in decent housing for our people will actually help them reach um, the goals that we're aspiring to as an iwi. So that, that's what we've done in terms of uh, our house, uh, ex state house housing. What you see here is one block of our new housing. So thought I'd talk a bit about the value systems that we use when we uh, think about homes, because for us, for people like me, I live in the village, play in the village, I work for the village, so you don't really get out that often. <laughs> so, so what we've got here, and the way we try to look at our development, if you can see there, um, with the actual structure, we use things like manakitanga. You know, what, what does that mean for us? And that's a key value for us, caring for one another. Uh, looking after one another. So in terms of the actual look of the buildings, they look like a marae, because for us, you know, that, that encompassing look and keeping people warm, you know, putting arms around them and having whānau close together is important. Whanaungatanga, 
uh, you know, being with family, being as one, that's important. So when you look at our development in terms of its structure, um, these are the types of things that I've often heard um, people say about it when they see it. So, you know, it's warm. Um, we've used, we've used um, lo uh, materials that don't need that much maintenance. Um, we've got mara because we believe that we should all be able to um, grow our own kai. So we've got mara kai. Uh, we have shared open spaces. Um, yeah, and we've got 30 houses there. So actually, in terms of rooms, it's, it's something like 100, 100 bedrooms um, in this development. Uh, we've done them with intergenerational living as one of the components that uh, we wanted to build it with. So for Māori, really important that we've got spaces for our parents, our children. I live with my mother till I was 30. So you know, those types of things have to be considered when you're looking at um, Māori housing. So, you know, for this one, you know, we've now got four bedroom homes, 130 square metres, but actually the way they're designed are so smart and allow us to be able to take in our elderly or our children, however we decide to do that. So um, smart design has been quite important for the way we do it. We've also been able to partner with people like Vector, uh, organisations like Vector, and we're the first residential development in the world to be uh, given the Tesla Powerwall batteries. So part of our uh, sustainability objectives with this housing development was to have solar panels. So each house has 10 solar panels, um, and we pay for those, but Tesla, have used us as a test case in terms of the the way that the solar and the batteries talk together in a residential setting. So we're really excited about being able to sort of be the test case for such technology, and that's exciting. Um, I just th thought I'd go to the next one. What's our why? This is our why. You know, so that's that's some of our families when the build was happening. Um, and we used to meet up once a month and the project managers used to let us walk around the site and everyone would wow at it for an hour and then would get booted off site. But, you know, when you're driving past, you know, what could be your first ever house and, you know, you, people from Morake, they don't tend to go that far. So it might be their first and last house. <laughs> Going through this process of being completely engaged in the build was really important so that we have that whānau buy-in in terms of what it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, we've been able to use... This, this whole project was aimed at first home owners. So you've got a really good mix of um, young professionals, um, families, you know, people with new children sort of moving back to this community, offering their skills, offering their language. One of the things for Ngāti Whātua Rākea, it was really important for us to be able to um, harness the language within this community. And when you can have direct contact with 30 families over a three-year three, three year period, you know, and you're able to really lay those foundations out about what it is we're trying to achieve overall as an iwi, you know, I think that's quite empowering. You'll have, like, I think 75% of us can speak fluently. So, you know, you're hearing the language lived. You're seeing uh, all of the resources being used appropriately. You know, you're having interactions with Fano, and, and it enables us to build a really strong community. So, so that's one there. It's just another... You know, we've got a diverse Fano, you know, and that's, um, that's really awesome. We've been used... Uh, we've won quite a few awards... Uh, for the development, but at the end of the day, our why is housing our whānau, and it has to be in a safe place and in a place that we actually have complete control over in terms of decision making, um, which has been quite important. Our financial model for Kainga basically saw Ngāti Whātua Rākei uh, build these houses and then become our bank. So we pay our mortgage back to Ngāti Whātua Rākei rather than to a BNZ, ANZ or Westpac. So at that point, uh, Ngāti Whātua Rāke decided that well, it was too hard for us to get um, any funding to be able to build decent homes, so we have to do, uh, invest directly back into ourselves. So we pay back Ngāti Whātua in a one lump sum, which also one of the financial literacy learnings was um, prior to whānau moving in here. You know, no one had ever paid rates. You know, n no one had ever had to be responsible for maintenance upkeep. Um, 
You know, no one knew how to live in, with a house with double glazed windows. You know, so all of these learnings were sort of wrapped up in this very Māori way of actually really uh, showing people the ropes on how to live with uh, in a new whare. Um, having to only pay once you know, for your mortgage and it looks after your insurance, looks after your mortgage repayments, looks after your long-term maintenance, looks after your short, uh, your general maintenance, and also there's a little bit of a, bit of a slush fund should the interest rates sort of um, peak. You know, that, that I think is one of the most innovative things that um, we were able to do. So that's just a few things about our housing development. Um, I think I'll leave it there. This, I just thought I'd leave it there with that picture because, you know, it's all about our whānau at the end of the day. And um, it's not just the house, it's home. And the community actually has to be quite invested in what it is that you're tr trying to achieve. Um, so I thought I'd just leave it there. Is that OK? OK. Hi, my name's Peter Jeffries. I'm the CEO of Court Community Housing. I thought in trying to address the issue delivering good medium density housing, I would just talk a little bit about the, uh, our context, court, community housing, give you a little bit of an overview of that in our history, um, and then just look at what we look at when we're trying to deliver uh, medium density housing. <coughs> court started 30 years ago. We, we came out of a local Baptist church in Ponsonby that's still around today. We're quite a separate entity to the church, but we very much value the the... Uh, accountability that they hold us to from a community perspective. We've been going for 30 years. We celebrated our 30th year anniversary uh, last year. We started uh, from something very small uh, where we got one house and just over the years we've sort of kept, the, uh, the trust has kept to its knitting, whereas today uh, we have 250 tenancies, 150 of properties we own ourselves and another 90 odd that we uh, rent off the market. We started specialising in uh, providing services for people with mental health, and today still a large percentage of our tenants would um, have mental health issues, but we're expanding that also into older people and into young families. At the same time, we specialise in one and two bedrooms. We're quite specific about that. We know that there's a strong market demand for that, and uh, especially within the cohort of the people that we are uh, representing. The model that we've sort of taken on, in the early days we started with what we called group homes, which were large sort of villas uh, from Ponsonby that we'd uh, have flatting situations. And slowly our model has sort of developed. We found that there was uh, one bedrooms, one and two bedrooms suited our cohort uh, well, so we started to go into that. Um, we found that clusters work quite well rather than just one or two, that if we got uh, four or five together we could build a little sort of community sort of together. There are some efficiencies for us. We wanted to expand those clusters so we, we uh, use a sort of pepper potting sort of model. We're across uh, most of Auckland now uh, but we, we try and uh, have little clusters in many different sort of places. Our, our, our normal sort of model when we started was uh, three or four. We thought that was good. Today, um, we're looking at larger sort of clusters uh, than that. Uh, we have a pipeline, development pipeline at the moment of 167 places that we're working, uh, that we've got uh, under development or we're uh, agreements to purchase. And our model has sort of changed to a bit larger now where the, the general size of a cluster that we look at is around the... Uh, 12 to 14, ideal. We have a couple that are larger than that, nine, at 19 units, and we even have one that we're looking at at 27. So we're really sort of pushing our sort of model in terms of what the delivery of social and affordable housing in one sort of uh, gap is. From that sort of little model of uh, group homes to pedipoling to clustering, our focus now uh, that we've sort of taken and it's a strategic sort of focus is one around placemaking. Now placemaking traditionally has been one that planners and designers um, in public places is all about. But I think in community housing we're trying to take that sort of concept and bring it down to, uh, for us, we're defining placemaking as what is making good places to live. And I think our sort of focus in that, and when we look at a medium density, it's about how do we make these places good places to look. And I think intrinsically we all sort of have a feel about that. 
um, what is a good place. And so when we look at the design of our places, there's one little acid test that I try to apply and with, with uh, court staff is, would you be happy living in that place? Or would one of your family members be happy living in that place? And I've got a couple of uh, young 20s um, children, and they're struggling to get onto the property sort of thing. But every time that I look at a place that we're, that, um, how we evaluate it and all the things that have to come in together, the final thing is, would, would you be happy to? Now, I know that from their perspective, there's a change happening here in terms of they're much more... Um, encouraging of that. I come from the old model where I've got a front and back lawn that I have to mow every fortnight and I curse it more often than not. But the model is sort of changing. But still that's the, I think, the key thing that we've got to look at. When court takes that on, that placemaking sort of view, there's a number of things and they've been, they've been covered uh, today and I'll just go through them very sort of quickly. But the first thing that we look at very strongly is its location. And I'll dig down into that um, to, uh, a little bit more later on. But then we look at, that's the wider location. Then we look at the actual smaller sort of neighbourhood uh, that we're going into. Then we look at the interior of the design of the um, sort of unit. You know, how do you get good uh, design into the space? And of course that operates also with the exterior of the unit. You know, how do we make the whole complex sort of um, uh, work? And then another important bit is the actual housing services that go with it. We can build these things, and I think some of the models that we've seen over the past, uh, we've, we've got, you know, we, our designers and architects can build wonderful places, but just how are they going to be managed and work, and how do we help all the tenants sort of get on? So they are all the sort of things that sort of um, come into it. And of course there's, there's the actual tenant and the placements of the sort of tenants that we put together, and how do we give them the best chance of forming communities and, and partnerships and you know, getting alongside each other. So all those things come into it, and I'm happy to discuss any of those in, in more sort of detail when I sort of sit down. But if I just start with the sort of location one, and this is specifically for um, social housing, and I just say it in the context of how court looks at it as such. But the big question that we're asking at the very start is, what can that suburb sort of handle in terms of its density and its social sort of housing? And there's a lot of pressures on at the moment for uh, um, affordable housing, in particular social housing. And it tends to be focusing those sort of places all into one sort of place. And we know what happens uh, when, that, uh, when that takes place. So we're very keen to first look at what the sort of social economics effect of where we're putting these houses in. And if, if there's a rule of sort of thumb and it's, it, it gets to bad from time to time, we don't want to go into any places where there's already um, a lot of social housing. And we think that the level there is around 15%. There's already a high concentration. We know that by coming into those areas, we're probably putting additional sort of pressures and that that over the long term, no matter what we build, no matter how we manage it, uh, no, um, the outcomes are going to be a little bit questionable. So the, the very first thing is that we're looking at the concentration that's already in that area. Then we come down, we say, well, how can that street handle it? Oh, first of all, how can that neighbourhood, have they got the amenities and facilities? And that's, of course, the public transport um, and the other sort of public amenities. Can they handle what we're about to put into this uh, community? Then if it ticks that, we come down to a sort of street level. How does that street and, and what we build on that street, is that going to be appreciated or are we giving ourselves a hard time because we're going to get a lot of sort of opposition? And that's a difficult one because we always struggle with the neighbourhood sort of relationships. And then once we've sort of started to tick those boxes, we then go back to and we start to look at what can we fit on that sort of site and what's the sort of design and, and what sort of building uh, can we get there. And then, of course, we get into the inside of it um, and we uh, start to look at the, you know, what makes a good place to actually live in. Um, but I might just stop there and, um, and leave that. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Um, ko Jake Kakita Kuingoa. Uh, ko Ngapo Hirato Ko Tiarua Ko Fakatohia. O ku iwi. No Fangre Kainga. Ko Ote Poto Humatua O Tematapihi. National Māori Housing Advocate. 
So hello everybody, my name is Jade. I'm scanning the room because I think I know probably quite a few of you here and also some people I haven't met before, so great to see you all. Um, so the organisation that I work for uh, was established or came out of a call to action from the 2010 Māori Housing Conference in Oturua. That was our first conference and we're coming up to our fifth conference in Hamilton this November. Uh, it was formally uh, incorporated at the end of 2011 and I was brought on as our first staff member when we were a tiny voluntary board with no resources uh, two years after that point in the lead up to the 2014 conference in Wanganui. Now we've um, grown a lot in that time, so we've been in full-time operations since uh, about 18 months ago and we now have a staff of six and growing. Um, so it's been very exciting to take the vision that our chairperson and our kumatua and many others along the way had for this entity and to be able to see it forward to this point. Uh, so basically we exist to promote better Māori housing outcomes, all the way from severe housing deprivation and homelessness right through to iwi as develop developers and asset holders and everything in between. Um, and a really sort of important element of connectivity to what we do is that we get out, we talk to our whānau on the ground, go talk to whānau who are living in a shack out in Kaihu, uh, which is what I did last week, or go and talk to um, whānau and, you know, who, are, who are on the Papakainga. Um, and we were in um, Hawke's Bay the week before and, and so on. I'll be in Christchurch tomorrow. We get around a lot, but then we also go and see our colleagues in Wellington, our senior officials, and we talk to ministers, and we make sure that the concerns, issues, and successful approaches that we're hearing from Māori organisations on the ground are actually making it up to that upper level. Um, and then we also look to make sure that there's better connectivity across the sector and that all the different players involved are moving towards that goal of better Māori housing outcomes. So it's pretty exciting and big kaupapa. So within our work program, we've got four key areas. Uh, one of them is māngai, which is our, our key systems advocacy role. Um, at the moment, we're really focusing on talking to the new government, as many others are trying to do as well. We've got our meeting with the minister later this month. Uh, and the key things we've been advocating, which was in our briefing to the minister late last year, were really around getting a dedicated minister for Māori housing getting our current Māori housing strategy, He Whare Ahuru, actually properly monitored and evaluated uh, with responsibility across the various ministries. We're looking to get a Māori housing unit established, which is something Labor campaigned on prior to the election. Um, and we're also leading um, some other work around the Kaupapa inquiries. I don't know if anyone's too familiar with those, but it's the next step for the Waitangi Tribunal. There's a judicial conference coming up next month in Wellington, so we've lodged a claim for that. Um, another area of our work program is really around sector development, uh, so uh, looking at showcasing successful examples. So this year we're doing a bunch of case studies, we're, we're um, recording a podcast and getting around the country, listening to some of these really good stories and sharing these successful models. Uh, we're also looking to increase the role we play in education and training, um, that kind of thing, sector development. And then the final area of our work program is out around research. And I can see some researchers in the room that I work with. Um, and so our role in research is really ensuring that that research uh, is basically contributing to evidence-based policy development and also that is appropriately connecting with aspirations and needs of communities. Um, so that's our kaupapa. I really, really love the first presentation from Anahira. I've been up to that papakainga a few times and it's just an incredible living example. And it's so inspiring for me, not just in my work, but just for my whanau at home, because that's what we want. We don't have it anymore, but we're working really hard to get there. And I talk to whanau around the country and I hear that same story. We, this is how we want to live, back on our whenua, as Māori, together, healthy, flourishing, all of these wonderful positive things. And so let's, let's work really hard to make more developments like that exist. And so what can we as various parts of the sector, be it Māori or the wider mainstream sector, how can we contribute to, to that vision of which um, Kainga Tuatahi is a really amazing example. So I don't think I have too much more to say. I think we'll just leave it for um, Hope's wonderful questions and this great discussion we're going to have in the room. But that's me. That's what I do. Um, kia ora.
constituency have heard the issues and the challenges and you've heard from the providers themselves about what they're doing and how things are evolving, if you like, for providers as well. Right, so we've got two, two mics. Um, we're going to get one roving around, so please feel free to ask any questions. We also still have with us the presenters from earlier this afternoon. So we've got Lisa, Sarah and Natalie still here, and of course Vuni. So please feel free to ask them any questions that you've got as well. So we'll start that right now. G'day, my, name, my name's John Duncan. Um, I used to be on the Beacon Board. I used to work for brands. I don't work for anyone anymore, so I can ask the questions I like. Um, <laughs> and, and no one will, will get upset. A lot of really exciting stuff that we've heard this afternoon. The most disturbing thing, to my mind, that I heard was a, almost a throwaway comment from Bernadette who said, Councils are interfering with adaptive reuse. Can you expand and can you tell us what we need to be doing about dealing with that? Because if we are short of the building sector workforce that we're being told about, we can't rely on doing everything from scratch. So adaptive reuse seems to me to be a really important issue that we're going to have to address. Comments? Yeah, look, I can't really speak on behalf of the planning regulations in Auckland because I don't know it well enough, but I know that when we explored the opportunities for, for utilising some of the buildings that were around for use for housing, um, that's where we came up against. We came up, the, uh, we, we came up against the regulations, but also the cost. And so it just became prohibitive. Um, and I guess, you know, I've had lots of conversations with Ian Castles and Wellington to understand, well, how did you make it happen? And, and obviously it's a different context. You know, the earthquake and the regulations um, kind of facilitated things that wouldn't happen elsewhere. So, you know, I think it's about having those further conversations and saying, why not? And because there's, you know, there's more than one place. So obviously we were looking in the CBD, but maybe we needed to look in wider jurisdictions. Um, so, yeah, that's work in progress, I think. Kia ora tatu. Jerome Partington from Jazzmex. Um, we, somebody, somebody mentioned slow housing taking a long time to, um, you know, holding the assets for a long time. And we've heard just suggestions of, but where's the slow money that's going to allow the expansion of community housing in New Zealand to um, grow and to meet the needs that are, and the problem, the challenges that are right ahead? Slow money is a nice word. Um, the community housing sector has been struggling and lobbying for years to get a constant flow of, of funds uh, for it. To deliver on social housing, and it's starting to look like affordable housing, there has to be uh, some input from government. And we follow, unfortunately follow the political cycle that goes up and down, and um, as yet, we've yet to con come across a, a a constant source, but it will always be the bind of this of the sector that it's it's never guaranteed. And the very latest at the moment is um, you know there's this great desire, but they haven't quite worked it out, and we're we're still not given any guarantee of long term uh, funding. Okay. Well. Um so I'll talk from the uh, Māori housing perspective, but I believe it's relevant to your question. Um, so I think as many may know, we only have one uh, finance product available for housing on Māori land, which is Kāinga Whenua. And it's very ineffective. We've had perhaps 23 loans, or maybe that's a couple more since I last heard that figure, but that's since 2009 when the product was established. Um, and there's just very few options. It's really, it's really ineffective. Uh, but something I've become really interested in is the Section 184 mortgage guarantee in the United States, which is quite similar to Kainga Whenua, um, except that they don't seem to have quite, th they've got different problems, but they don't have the same problems that we have. So the issue around securitization, where the home has to be able to be physically removed, they had that issue at the beginning, they don't have it anymore. They securitize it against a leasehold interest in the land, which is 30 years with 30 years right of renewal. Now I think, I wonder why doesn't that work here? And I think it's because our underwriting through Housing New Zealand is a lot more risk averse than whatever system they have in the United States. 
Um, but some of the cool things that have been happening there, and this relates to what's happening at Ngāti Whātua actually, is that some of the, so, so there, like here, any bank can pick it up. We only have Kiwi Bank. They've had lots of banks pick up their product. What started to happen is that tribal authorities are taking on the role of lending institution. They're charging the same rates that the banks will, but they're reinvesting that difference back into social and affordable housing. And by all accounts, it's working really well. Um, but it does seem that you need to have a critical mass, be it land, be it assets, uh, for that to be effective. Um, so there's good lessons there. Something I've been, oh, and another one we've been looking at, or that interested me, is the work that I understand the New Zealand Housing Foundation is doing around an equity fund for community housing. Now, I haven't touched base with them recently, so I'm quite interested to see how that's going. But the last time I heard about it, and others will probably know a lot more than me, it did seem that it was sort of bypassing the banks and the government to focus on philanthropic sector funding. So there's a few good models out there. I've been trying, trying to get the support to run a Māori housing finance think tank um, so that we can reform kāinga whenua. And the approach was really to figure out what's going wrong with kāinga whenua, but also to understand where there has been successes, what were the critical success factors, um, and then identify where an optimised kāinga whenua would fit in the landscape of Māori housing finance need, where the loan product, sorry, where the um, grant products sit, where conventional loans sit, and where are the gaps and what new products will we need to fill that space. So I suggest a similar process could also work for community housing, but there's absolutely a need for capital grants. It's something we've retained in the Māori housing space, although if you look at it, we've got money for about 20 houses a year. It's hardly anything. Oh, sorry, anyone else want to...? Carl Rusher from MSA. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, Carl Rusher from MSA. Um, sustainable adaptation was only very briefly touched on and for all of your fantastic initiatives that's going to be a big issue in the future. Um, I believe that many of the houses we're building today will not survive the future conditions that we might see over the course of this century, even over the course of the next two or three decades. So in the area I live, last year we had five 100-year weather events. So far this year we've had two 100-year weather events. Not yet affecting housing too much, but driveways are being washed away. And it's getting worse and it's getting more often. So I think in the, in, in the lifetime of most people in this room, we will see houses that we're building today at severe risk. What I'd like to know is, in your initiatives, and anybody can answer, have you considered, um, you know, uh, uh, environmental adaptation, that being the, you know, the UN's put that on the same level as environmental sustainability or mitigation, so, um, or, or um, uh, carbon mitigation. So what, are you thinking of in that, those terms? Are you planning that? Are you building that into your buildings? Because I think it will be a major problem which will upset your, initiate, your, 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 your plans in, 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 the, in the few decades to come. Yeah, the only thing that we can say is that we're using LifeMark as our kind of benchmark, and so the buildings that we're doing are LifeMark 6. Um, that's what we're seeking to achieve. Um, and so really it has to be, you know, it has to be back on the agenda that that's what has to happen, and it comes back to my point earlier about building things quickly. Um, so that's all I can say, really. Hi, I'm Scott Cracknell from Context Architects. We're doing quite a bit of housing housing work. My big question is around governance. Um, sorry, my, my big question is around governance. I think um, the definition of medium density needs to tie back to governance as well and the number of people that you're trying to manage within a within a particular development. And I think that, that becomes quite a critical 
critical tipping point. Um, I was talking to the person from Brands earlier on about the six story as a definition for, for medium density. Um, in my mind, that's that's quite a long quite a long way up. I mean, six stories is is quite comfortable for a suburb, but I think we need to factor the governance um, governance component in as well. I was, I was cur curious to hear, probably particularly from Bernadette, around your models of governance for kind of slightly bigger bigger pockets of of you know one particular group in housing. So. I, I'm probably just not clear exactly what you mean by governance. Do you mean the body corporate, or do you mean the organisation that's managing the properties? M more the organisation that's managing the properties and um, I guess checking out for the welfare of the tenants. So I mean, I think a, a big a big tipping point is if you get, a, say, if you get more than forty people in an apartment building, you probably need a concierge, or forty families in an apartment building, you probably need a concierge. That that's sort of the. I guess sort of typical rule of thumb from from working in the UK in, in social housing. Um, and I, I just wanted to sort of see yeah. how you. So we have things. that. So we have the on-site management, and the other thing is that we're taking. Yeah, look, I think you know, you know, if Peter's saying that they manage particular cohorts which have mental health problems, people are managing ex-prisoners. You know, we can't lump all of social housing into one group. You know, because they're quite different in terms of their adaptability and their ability to live independently as well. So we have to be careful that we're not just throwing labels around. But in terms of um, you know the the properties that we're managing, we do manage them very intensively, and that's something that we believe is a core part of how we manage those tenancies. We're there, we're visible, we make it very clear what the rules of engagement are in terms of reciprocity of what we'll deliver and what they have to do. Look after your property, get on with your neighbour, and pay your rent on time. And in return, you know we actually manage them very intensively. Um, the second thing is the critical risk for for I think in social housing is when you're in private when you're in mixed developments and you have absentee landlords so you get investors who buy in and then you don't know who's living there and so that's why we're managing the body corporate is because we want to have visibility and they will have the same rules and regulations so maybe that answers your question about governance add something if that's okay um i don't think this is what you were getting at but i'm gonna talk about it anyway um so <laughs> So we do see a lot in Papa Kainga that that's a real issue around and decision making, because often you're getting um, Fano who maybe I mean depending on how the how long since they might have lived on the Fenua and whether they've been urbanised and moved away etc. You're getting Fano that haven't lived together for perhaps several generations, and they're learning to get to know one another. They're reconnecting with the Fenua and within themselves, and. You can't take for granted that the rules are just understood and everyone's going to follow them. So there can be a real process of kind of setting up the expectations and rules and formalising them and we've all agreed and then you get into actually living there and, um, and some of these issues start to crop up and sometimes they can be really serious because people might bring behaviours and issues and things into the papakainga um, from, from their life before they lived in the papakainga. And it was something that really interested me was uh, I, I led a study tour to Canada and the US last year. And one of the um, projects we went to was um, OK Oenge in um, New Mexico, one of the, I think it's 19 Pueblos. And they were saying the same thing, and that really got me. It was only one generation of moving out of the Pueblo and into the HUD homes, which are pretty much right next door. But um, everyone was used to having their 100 by 100 foot section. They weren't used to living in attached houses. Um, there were stories about how, um, you know, younger members, they were not giving the, the sacred spaces the same respect that they really ought to. And it was just, there was, it's just a whole learning process. And that was just in one generation and moving next door. Where you, so I think we're, we're up against the same kind of challenges. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I mean, having written policies and procedures is so important. Sometimes you need to have some outside intervention if there's a crisis that happens. Um, and it's a really big thing around setting the rules and, and everyone agreeing to them. And, and there's not really a simple answer. I think it's a generational thing. I think it comes back to being really interested in the people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. And responding to those problems quickly. Yeah. Don't let them keep going.
Sorry, I got there first. <laughs> uh, I've got two questions for two different people. I don't know if it's easier if I ask them both at the same time. Um, so the first question is for Anahira, and it's just in relation to um, um, with the development on Kupe Street and people buying into it sounds like got a mortgage like anyone else. Um, and I was just wondering what happens at the point if there is a desire to move on, do you sell back to someone from Ngati Faro? Is it like creating a second market? And I was just curious about how that works. And shall I ask my second question now too? Um, can you remember that? Uh, so the second question is uh, for Bernadette, and it's in relation to the um, to the development in Glen Eden. And I've um, I was actually discussing that example just recently because I'm sorry. I didn't do the. Uh, I didn't follow the protocol. My name is Anna Hancock. I work at Tauranga City Council, <laughs> um, and um, and what we're facing affordability issues in Tauranga, and uh, there's been some studies that have been done on feasibility for high density developments uh, by a company called Veros, and in their study it appears that market feasibility for high density developments is is just not there, and when you know the, the typical thing about developers, developers will be able to create high density developments when the area is market attractive. And Glen Eden is not a market attractive place to go in and put a 10 storey or whatever it is building. And so I was thinking about the role where you've got a developer um, working with community housing providers to provide that density and wondering about opportunities for that in places where you have housing issues and it's not market attractive, so developers can't just be going in there to make that profit. And wondering about your views about how that might roll out in the future, where there is the desire to create high density, but in areas where you don't have that market attractiveness, how you get more of that done. Kia ora. Um, so for us in Ngāti Whātōrake, uh, you have to be a direct descendant to be able to own a home there. So our homes at Kainga are on a 150-year lease um, and you must be a registered member or descendant back to the land. So that means that if we were to sell, um, we also have to sell back. So whilst you talk about the second market, we've never actually had to deal with the second market before because we go there, stay there and never leave. So um, once people start actually realising equity in and especially with our ones, because you can't, you because we don't have a second market. Um, other homeowners in our in Orake can't realise equity growth. But for this one, we have uh, built it into uh, the Kainga model because this was intended to be a first step uh, for first homeowners, so that they can realise some equity and then can move on to the uh, private market because. We believe that that's where you can get some true financial independence. So um, th for us, we, we haven't quite uh, understood what that second market's going to look like or how we're going to value it, but you have to sell your home back to a registered member. Um, look, I think it's a really valid question. Um, I suppose the thing with Ted Manson, he's a little bit different in that it is a financial, it is, um, well, he's very financially wealthy, so that helps. Um, but he's come from social housing and he's never forgotten that. Um, and he started from the beginning and he built that business up. And so he's actually given back, so he's not looking for a commercial return. I mean, obviously he's clipping his ticket through the way, through the, the development because his construction company is building it. Um, but he's not there for that financial gain. And we've gone through those journeys with other developers who want to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and say, well, you know, we'll take, um, we'll take this and we'll take that and we'll build more houses. And we've argued that we don't want that density. So we just, as community housing providers, have to be really strong in our position and not compromise. That we will just, you know, we're not in a game to just kind of get as many houses as we can and hope that we can make it work. You know, we actually do push back and know what, what the thresholds are in terms of commerciality and, and, and also the feasibility. So we do our own feasibility and we know what the, you know, what MSD will provide in terms of fees. I guess the key risk for us, and I think I think it's something that we haven't talked about today is risk. And I think that's about the longevity of government um, initiatives and government funds and government promises and whether they'll actually sustain the duration of the 25-year contracts we have. Um, and as an organisation that's been subject to um, sovereign risk on four occasions now, um, we know that, that that is very real. And I think the second risk factor in terms of bringing developers into the sector is the, you know, the, the metrics that 
um, MSD needs to get more high priority tenants off the wait list. You can't put high priority tenants into medium and high density housing because they don't have the skills to kind of cope with that close living proximity. Um, so, you know, I think it's about risk and return and I think it's a valid question, but, um, and I guess, yeah. I could keep talking, but I won't. Yeah, yeah. Kira Koto, uh, Mark Slade, Community Housing Aotearoa. Um, so I've got more of a kind of a systems question around, um, so we, we increasingly recognise that increasing urban density is a desirable thing from a, a whole range of reasons. Um, um, but doing um, medium density housing is part of a wider housing and urban planning system. Um, so therefore local government is a key um, partner in this, in this conversation. Um, and yet, as we, we recognise from the way that various um, changes in planning um, systems have, have happened, councils are quite often risk averse and pressure, um, you know, come under pressure from communities. My question is, how do we work better in partnership with local government and communities to actually achieve um, medium density housing and these all the ancillary benefits that arise from that? I think we have to clearly we have to work closer with council and and the local community to get the acceptance that we're on a slow story with the unitary plan coming in in terms of what intensification looks like. One of the impressive slides I think that Bernadette sort of showed was that uh, medium density is a is a slow sort of uh, path. We don't have to go from a single uh, house up to a uh, six-story uh, building, and in fact, there's a lot of intensity that can happen in between. And some of Court's most successful developments have just been two-story uh, that started off in duplexes that we had out at Waima here uh, to fourplexes, which is one that we uh, commonly do. That's two, two down, two up sort of things. And we're only just going to our first three-story uh, um, apartment you know, uh, development as such. So I think uh, we can work certainly with uh, w uh, the expectations of the... Um, of the community in terms of it not having to be, you know, all towers and sort of stuff and do it sort of gradually um, on, a, on a gradual scale. Okay, I know I just said that I might not talk, but I will. Um, so <laughs> something that um, I think is, has a lot of potential and, and has, has shown that overseas is urban development authorities. And so I don't know, um, I think many of you may be aware of the discussion document that was produced by the last government uh, la early last year. And that was quite interesting because it seemed to kind of fly under the radar, but if you read the document, uh, it basically says that central and local government um, have to agree to a project area which will have some kind of um, identification criteria and constraints. And within that area, um, an urban development authority will be uh, created. And that Urban Development Authority has uh, terrifying but amazing powers. So in that original vision, basically the UDA has the ability to uh, pub acquire land under public works um, compulsorily. It has the ability to uh, consolidate Crown land holdings, reroute any existing infrastructure, put in new infrastructure. Uh, it can override the Resource Management Act, can override the uh, district plan. And if the Urban Development Authority and the development entity are separate rather than one and the same, it also has the ability to be the consent consenting authority in place of the council. Um, which all sounds terrifying, but also could be really exciting opportunity. So in that original document, it had iwi at the same level as any other private developer. And something that we were really interested in exploring is what are the opportunities for iwi to have a leading role at every single level, whichever place they wish to participate. Because the thing um, that David was saying earlier about how community housing providers, they're from that place, they're not going anywhere. Well, that's how iwi feel as well. They're not going anywhere. They're invested in the long-term future. And a lot of a lot of the um, iwi groups that we've been talking to, they don't necessarily want to uh, hold on to all the housing stock or be the developer or even prioritise their own tribal members sometimes. Often it's about getting better outcomes for that community over which they feel they have the responsibility. And so I think if you can master plan these things to get all of these great uh, social outcomes, 
And also, if you can uh, retain a certain percentage of the stock, then I think you can prevent a lot of what we've seen with everything being over to the free market, which is the prices being completely out of control. Now, it's not the only part. It's a complex system and there's lots of other solutions, but I think urban development authorities are something we need to be talking about because although the government has changed, Labor in the lead up to the election, they were campaigning on an affordable housing authority. That is a UDA. It just has a different name. So just encourage everyone to think about it. <laughs> Sorry, I just have one other thing, and I think it's the lack of a strategic plan for housing. So there is no housing strategy, there is no plan, there's no roadmap, and yet we're off announcing how many houses we're going to build and where we're going to build them and who's going to build them even. But actually, you know, it's a, there's a long-term 10-year plan opportunity for councils to actually identify what is their housing need, who's the players in the market, who's building what, you know, from student housing to aged care housing to social housing. You know, the whole picture has to be laid out so then all the people in this room can say, well, I can do that part. I can design, I can fund, I can participate, I can build. And right now, there's nowhere for people to actually play in the game. <laughs> uh, Bernie Smith, uh, Monte Cecilia Housing Trust. Uh, Peter, question to you. Uh, it's just, uh, I find it interesting that uh, court's uh, journey in the sense of uh, villas I think your biggest one that you're looking at is 29. And I'm just thinking about the uh, creating community and what medium density looks like. So is the bigger development because of uh, price pressures or is it because of uh, better uh, community cohesion uh, for the cohorts uh, that you're working with? Right. If I... If I reverse it, uh, the sort of question, certainly there's a lot of price pressure in terms of um, how do we get affordable housing. And as we all know, the prices have just been skyrocketing. The government's trying to cap how much they're wanting to spend. And so all the pressure is on uh, how do you get more smaller places into the same bit of land. And, and hey, that's a real struggle. And it goes against everything I think that we all intrinsically would like to sort of uh, see, but that's the real price, uh, that's the sort of affordability pressure uh, that's on at the moment. So we have to play that game to a degree, and we see overseas that they're way ahead on t in terms of that, and we're trying to defend uh, 50 square metres uh, being the size for a one-bedroom place, and at uh, deliv market delivery costs of ten to $11,000 per square metre, suddenly, instantly, we're already unaffordable. So... Certainly price is the, uh, the pressure. But the other thing that comes into it when we look at the idea of, of place making, what makes a good place, is just what the other facilities are around. And we have pushed our model, which is up to this, this one block where we've got 27, but we looked very carefully about where that's being located. Now, in that place, we're right next door to uh, parks, to a swimming pool, uh, to schools. We're bordering right on the commercial thing, we've got a supermarket within walking distance and public transport uh, nearby and a lot of this sort of green space that the place is looking out to. Uh, the block all has um, a lot of north facing sort of units and good sort of uh, sunlight coming into it and the design where we believe will work but uh, it's to be tested. So it's again it's always about taking all the bits and pieces to see whether uh, with the compromises that you have to make uh, whether you think it uh, will work or not. But certainly your point, the more concentrated we get, um, the more important it is that all those things start to line up for you. And um, we don't, you know, uh, this is pushing us a bit, but it's, but uh, we're trying to push the model a little bit for us. So I've got a question, Peter. How are you going to manage this differently to the smaller complexes that you've got? Uh, management will be absolutely key to this, especially in social housing, but any sort of uh, high concentration of rental housing, you want to have uh, good management. For us, we have, uh, we've we've been dabbling with our, um, our tenancy management sort of ratios, and um, court has been currently operating at about 130 to uh, one sort of tenancy manager. We're, we're uh, talking to our staff and taking this sort of... Um, 
uh, project down. We're looking at dropping that as we start this uh, project, and we'll drop it down lower. And even to start with, we'll even put in, you know, this, this block will get a lot of sort of resourcing. Well, all blocks get a lot of sort of resourcing. And from our experience, it takes about 12 months to sort of bed a sort of community in, um, and, and we'll just see how it works. It may be uh, that this block continues to take a lot of resource to get it to the sort of standard that, uh, that we're wanting. And we're fully aware that the more people that you put together, the more sort of social sort of issues uh, that you get. If, you know, with 25 people, if everybody in there expects to have one party once a year uh, on a Saturday, hey, we've got a party block. Um, and we've got problems. And that's the problems that you get with, with density, the real sort of challenges that you get. So we've got to uh, and, you know, put a lot of time into it, talk to these tenants, try and get them to take sort of ownership. There's the whole sort of tenancy management. But the, but the trick isn't to sort of think that it's going to solve itself. It's going to be one of, of bedding it down and putting a lot of resource in early on and, and possibly for quite a long time. So Greg Freeman, I uh, work with the Housing Foundation as a project manager down in Waima here. Um, essentially, yeah, we have um, social rental within um, a mixed tenure environment with um, many, many um, privately owned homes. One of the, um, the most important things is a, a channel of communication so that the homeowners, um, if there's issues happening, that they feel that they're being heard and the, <coughs> excuse me, that there's not a level of frustration that builds up, that nothing is being done about um, the particular um, antisocial behaviour that's happening. Uh, I think homeowners um, and neighbours also want to uh, not only have the sort of channel of communication, but seeing things that are actually being done to uh, address the problem. What we found in Waimahia was that uh, there was a quite a level of goodwill um, with the neighbours. Um, so that um, they didn't really mind that um, their neighbours were <laughs> renting or um, social tenants um, in any way at all, but they just um, were concerned about the behaviour. So there was a level of goodwill um, there that um, they just wanted the issues to stop and they just wanted to keep engaging with the the the, the neighbours just on a, on a normal basis. So I suppose that's just the, the two things that come to mind. Um, Yes, you will experience antisocial behaviour um, if our experience is anything to go by um, because, and it's been mentioned here, that um, many of our, our tenants are not used to living in that same environment of, um, of a sort of close neighbourhood. Um, and just to speak frankly, you know, they're bringing issues from outside. They, um, the, these antisocial th things that behaviours that are happening in the rest of our city, smoking meth and um, doing all sorts of, of things and, and having a party lifestyle, things like that. And it's just our, our neighbours are wanting to make sure that, um, that they feel the, the issues are being dealt with on a long, they don't want short term solutions, but long term, yeah. Does that, does that help? So 
So just about my response to that, I, I, I have a challenge, which is I think one of the answers is, is, is goes to the governance question, because one of the things I don't think we do, we're not bold enough, is to take those communities and allow them to be at the decision-making right from the beginning at the levels they need to be. What we do is we create structures and then we, we go and engage and consult. And no matter what you do, it's us telling them what to do, we'll listen. And I think um, the models that I'm used to seeing um, are much bolder, um, where that kind of participation is integrated in those models. Uh, you see, it, um, particularly in the UK, it's in, entrenched in that. And over time, and it does take time, um, you get greater ownership, greater appreciation, because at the end of the day, you're leaving those communities with a real stake in the future of their communities for their future generations. So it's not just the doing to. Um, but I, I think the problem is that we, we pass the buck and we don't, integrate them into, into the governance, into, into the governance of, of the organizations and the structures we create. Oh yeah, I, I had a question for Anaheda. Um, Cause I mean, you've got a beautiful, um, beautiful amount of gorgeous new housing and a fantastic, oh, gorgeous, and a fantastic um, financial model. Um, what I was curious about is, um, and you also have very enabling zoning along Coupe Street. So what I was going to ask you is what has been kind of the general response and feel to that increase in density amongst Ngāti Whātua? And, you know, are people willing to see even higher densities that that zoning enables, for, you know, in the, in the new developments that you're doing further along Coupe Street? Yep, that's a really good question. Um, we did an overall master plan for the whole of Ōrāke um, in 2011. And that master plan took us about four years and it sort of showed houses in places where there are no houses right now and it was a shock. And so nine years later, I think people have come to the realisation that if we really want to have whānau back living in the community, we have to make concessions on the land. Um, we don't have to pay for, our, for the land. So that's, that's sort of taken out of any component when it comes to the house. So all we're paying for is the house on top of the land. Um, when we did Kainga, people were up in arms about how close it was and having houses joined together. Now, we've been living in them for two years. You know, people say, why don't you build 50? You know, so, you know, it just, I think attitudes are changing. And I think um, when you can demonstrate progress in terms of trying to reach those um, goals about utilising your land appropriately, people people listen and, and um, you know, they, they take that on board. Otherwise, you know, people right now, people that are complaining about not having um, their quarter acre section are coming around because their, their grandchildren and great grandchildren won't have anywhere to go if we continue the way we're going. So it's an intergenerational uh, view that we take and um, yeah, I think we're heading in the right direction. People are ready for apartments now. So <laughs> it's great. Well, it is about showing that it can work. Um, and showing that it can work well, and then by demonstrating it, um, hopefully we're changing attitudes and approaches out there as well. Any other questions? Or viewpoints? Oh, one in the middle there. Thanks, Anna. Kia ora, everyone. Alison Rocky here from Ministry for the Environment. What would you change if you could change one or two things about the existing legislative framework to make the delivery of social housing and better housing outcomes, including medium density housing, easier or better in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. Would you change anything, Peter? At the moment, our greatest uh, one of our greatest uh, issues with the developments is to de is dealing with council, and it's really about the speed that they're processing um, uh, the consents and and their understanding of what we're trying to achieve, and yet being tied back by um, some pretty rigid um, sort of conditions that are, uh, that are there. Now, there's a lot of flexibility coming through Auckland with the unitary plan, but the interpretation of that and just the council sort of delivering and getting on board with uh, allowing you know, groups to get on and do what they have to do is probably our greatest uh, sort of issue. So I, th I think the mechanisms are there, but we just haven't had uh, time or experience, um, well, the council hasn't really taken it on board of, of what that should be able to allow and what good 
uh, medium density can and should be looking like. So my thing would be about uh, trying to get the council up to speed um, uh, with the flexibility and, and the very debate that we're sort of having here in terms of what uh, good density could look like and address it in an, afford in an affordable sort of manner. Okay, I had, to, I had to think which ones I was going to commit to. There's quite a lot of legislative change that could help. Um, so I'd, I'd already talked about urban development authorities. Um, there was proposed urban planning legislation, new urban planning legislation. I actually think even though some of the changes sound scary, if it's done right, it could be very effective. Um, and the other one I wanted to talk about was uh, we have a Māori Housing Act, Māori Housing Act 1935. It's never been repealed, uh, but it's currently sitting there dormant. We had quite significant uh, resources associated with that act until 1977. Um, and, and so it had a lot of power and steadily pieces of that power have been taken away along with the resourcing. So we're really keen to initiate a revitalisation of the act to allow for a significant increase in funding for Māori housing. Uh, we're also looking to use that legislative lever to get in our Minister for Māori Housing um, and to really get, well, we have a Māori Housing strategy. It's not being monitored or evaluated or really implemented properly. So I think if um, some of that strategic stuff is written into the legislation, that would also help. I think there's one other thing too, which is government departments having to line KPIs. So, you know, the government MB um, had a Crown Land project, um, has, uh, Auckland Council had an affordable housing fast track program, and then they set up Panuka Auckland, and then Panuka Auckland said, oh, we have to get the highest and best use of that land. So misaligned KPIs, you know, so there's no kind of KPI that cuts through them all that says affordable housing is a mainstream, it's a really important agenda, and we need to cut through all your different KPIs. Every organisation should have a KPI around affordable housing. Uh, a question for Peter. Peter, you mentioned that when you go uh, looking for where you might do a development, you look at the neighbourhood capacity for what you're wanting to put there, but also the street capacity for what you want to put there, and that you look at levels of resistance. And I just wondered, how do you try to establish that, and when do you, do you decide, decide to push on and pull out? Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, mm. The overview of when we're looking um, at the position, again, I think I mentioned before, is about how we think whether we're going to fit into this community or not. The worst outcome that we can possibly get is that we go into an environment and that uh, we have the community uh, reject us in a sense or give us a hard time, especially for some of our tenants if we're putting them into what could possibly be a hostile sort of environment hey, we're in a losing situation and the past court has sold out of places where you know we, we just haven't been invited. So it's trying to be sensitive to what uh, we think that neighbourhood is going to allow us to happen. And I have to say that that doesn't just go across economic places. We've been very accepted in some parts of Ponsonby and Hearn Bay um, uh, historically and being rejected in some areas where you thought that we would fit in uh, quite easily. But there is a sense of just trying to weigh up what the impact of our development is going to have on that area. Um, now that's a very tricky one, and I think everybody sort of knows that, and the strategy before about consultation, about going in with communities. Um, I know Greg at Waima here, which was a big development, did a tremendous job in terms of getting everybody in the wider community involved in the decision making that was happening and, and hearing their sounds and what have you. The other strategy is when when the development's really small that we can just sort of, I, I dare say this, sneak in there and build it. But we have to be very confident, com confident when we do that, that we are going to have a low impact on that on that community and uh, address it after the case. And uh, we've got some developments coming up and my next job is to sort of turn up on the doorstep of those of our neighbours and introduce ourselves um, uh, that we are sort of arriving um, as such. So it, it's a tricky one, but we do have to engage. We never get away with not engaging with our, uh, with our neighbours because it's just a big sort of risk. I can tell you some... From our point, horror stories in terms of some of the responses that we've given, but hey, we still have to engage um, and try and work it out. But some of that goes forward and just using our intuition about 
what is the risk that we're taking on going into some of these communities? Thanks. I just wondered um, what you thought about council development levies and whether they should be um, eliminated for affordable housing or whether that's a, a, a false uh, red herring. Yeah, let me start on this. <laughs> council do absolutely nothing for community housing in Auckland. And that's a bit of a bold statement. But in terms of them helping us do what we're trying to do, and that's provide affordable housing, and given the city's in a crisis for affordable housing, I think it's the community housing sector that's been delivering the only community housing that's been coming out. We've got zip from council in terms of any sort of financial sort of help at all. And so, hey, you pushed a hot button uh, for me. But in terms of the way that they could be helping us financially, they could be doing all sorts of things with regards to capital contribution, water contributions, helping us get through the planning sort of stage, um, make it uh, more easy in the in wider communities for us to take a part and, and recognising that. But I don't. Uh, the ten years that I've been in, uh, recently involved. Uh, and the many council committees I've sort of sat on and had been to discussions, I've found nothing of practicality where they've helped us in any sort of way. Okay, there's a bit of an alcohol theme to the wrap-up, which is that um, all of you lovely presenters and all of the speakers today get um, one of these each. So thank you very much. I wish I could have uh, handed it over as you finish, but at least um, uh, we've got through a fantastic afternoon. So thank you very much. Um, okay, just a couple of things whilst I wrap up. Uh, First up, we always send a survey out at the end of a Housing Matters event to get your opinions about how the day went. Please could you take the little five minutes of time to fill it in. We'll try and make it really uh, fun for you to do that. Um, and uh, particularly, I think what we'd like is an idea of further topics uh, that would deepen this discourse going forward because we're intending using this, I guess, as a medium uh, to start that conversation and keep it going. Um, so please let us know what you would like uh, in future Housing Matters events. Um, I think uh, we're also probably going to take this more widely down to Christchurch as a medium density community housing sector. So uh, if you represent organisations that are in Christchurch and Wellington, we'll go there. We were thinking of Tauranga, but you've come up here, so fantastic. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's really good. Um, so, yeah, finally, really, I just want to say um, a big thank you again to the panellists and the speakers. Just one more round of applause for their fantastic efforts. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to once again thank our kind and generous sponsors, Brands uh, and the Building Levy, for actually sponsoring this event and allowing the, you to get here. Uh, and then Boffa Miskel, who, thank you very much. Uh, there's some beautiful drinks, I think, and some nibbles uh, for you to indulge in. So we'll have to thank them for that. That's very good of them. Uh, and then Beacon and Cha, who've come together to put the event on. Thank you very much. The Policy Observatory for this fine uh, space here. Uh, and then um, we haven't mentioned resines yet, but you all have a little paint pot, which is M&M's, which kept me sustained for half the afternoon, so hopefully it did the same for you too. And Razine's been a long time supporter of Beacon, so we'll give a shout out for them as well. Uh, and then the final thank you is really the energy in the room, you guys as an audience, it's been really terrific. Uh, please let the discussions continue. I could do with a drink, I'm sure you could too. So we'll see you again at the next Housing Matters event. <laughs>